so welcome to this uh, talk on a boot time reduction. Uh, standard license stuff, we can kind of skip that. Uh, quick mention about myself, I'm Chris Simmons, I'm an author and trainer, and um, the only important thing on this slide really is the fact that I've written a book. Um, in fact, you'll notice Mastering Embedded Linux Programming uh, second edition, so this actually means I've written the same book twice. So that's kind of a, of a advantage, I guess. Oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, so this is the traditional uh, boot time reduction uh, talk that we always have at Embedded Linux Conference. And um, so what's it about? So we all want shorter boot time reduction. That's always uh, a requirement. Nobody ever comes along to your desk and says, hey, your system is working too fast. Make it boot more slowly. OK, it never happens. Um, so you may ask, why is this? Uh, I I gave my first boot time reduction uh, presentation uh, in 2008, and we're still talking about it. Why, why is that? that? Oops. Why is that? Um, and it's really because there is a conflict uh, between the requirements of having software that is uh, general purpose and will probe hardware and work in a wide variety of uh, environments versus software that uh, does exactly the right thing and does exactly that, exactly that right thing at exactly the right time. So mostly this is about how to uh, customize the software excuse me, uh, in order to make it more specialized to your particular uh, requirements. Um, the, other th the other aspect of it is that uh, we're software engineers. So if we're given the task of optimizing something, we'll keep on optimizing it until, well, forever. Uh, so we, we need something, we need somebody to tell us when to stop. And that's kind of a, uh, a topic of this, uh, of this talk. So the issue comes down to um, what is your requirement? How fast do you want it to boot? And how much effort are you prepared to put in to uh, get into that requirement? Um, and how big a mess are you going to leave once you've done all of that? So let me let me illustrate that that last point. So this is a British Reliant Robin three-wheeler car, um, very popular. If you've ever watched Top Gear, you will certainly see uh, some of these being destroyed. Um, so it had an 850 cc engine. It was never uh, a fast machine, but hey, given an engineer, uh, we can improve it. We can make it go faster with enough effort and uh, customization. So the issue is how much uh, time do you want to put in and when you've finished, how maintainable is this? How safe is this? Uh, is this really what, uh, what you want to do? So. So this is a pragmatic uh, view of re reducing uh, boot time. And I want to emphasize the uh, measurement and then the evaluation of the, of the um, uh, result uh, and then how to go about modifying the system to take that measurement into account and to improve that particular metric. And I have to give uh, um, attribution here to uh, Andrew Murray uh, his presentation uh, at uh, ELC Dusseldorf, I think it was a couple of years back, um, kind of inspired me to, uh, to, to do, it, do it this way. Um, I'm going to attempt a live demo, uh, but if it doesn't work, I'll just skip over that bit. And um, the measurements I've, I, I wanted to kind of make it a little bit concrete, so um, I used uh, a BeagleBone uh, as a demo system. Um, it's not a particularly fast uh, system, as you probably know. And I'm starting off with a pretty much vanilla uh, Yocto project build. Uh, I actually used the uh, Qt4e uh, demo image as my example because that booted up quite nicely on my Beagle, uh, Beagle bone. 
Um, oh, the one thing I have changed from the default is I switched to using system D uh, because that seems to be the, the more common use case these days. And in terms of measuring uh, the boot time, uh, I'm going to be emphasizing the, the three common tools that you would use uh, for this. So we'll be using uh, Grab Serial uh, to measure the entire uh, boot uh, process. And then we'll be using um, Boot Chart to look at the uh, user space um, time usage, and Boot Graph to look at the kernel uh, boot usage. usage. So these are all nice off-the-shelf things. These just kind of work. You may want, uh, in a more serious environment, to have certain speci more specialized ways of measuring these things. Uh, ultimately, the only real way to measure the exact time from which the power is applied to the, 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 the application starts running is to use some, uh, some external hardware, like an oscilloscope, and then instrument your code by putting uh, code in to change GPIOs and then just monitor those GPIO wiggles. Okay, okay, okay. This, this is too much detail, uh, but yeah, we'll, 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 I'll actually, I have some time for questions and, and such at the end. Um, so when I say oscilloscope, I, I, I'm taking that in from the software definition of, of oscilloscope, which includes logic analyzers. That's just an oscilloscope, as far as I'm concerned, for the purposes of this uh, presentation. But yeah, some uh, some kind of external uh, uh, device is all I mean here. Um, Okay, so starting off then with Grab Serial, this is typically where you'll start for uh, measuring uh, your, 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 your boot performance. Um, so uh, Grab Serial was written by uh, Tim Bird, who I'm sure you all know, and who is the, uh, one of the instigators of this whole conference, in fact. And so when he's not organizing conferences, he occasionally writes some software as well, it seems. And one of those things was, boot, uh, was uh, grab serial. A nice little Python script simply grabs whatever's there on a particular serial port, adds in a timestamp and a few other things. Uh, really handy. And it's, it's particularly handy because it's non-intrusive. Uh, you don't have to change the software on the target at all. You just are capturing the serial port. So here's uh, an example. Um, we need to tell it which device to capture from. We need to add the minus T switch to actually add in the timestamps. And then the minus M thing, this is a string that will uh, tell Grab Serial to start making measurements. So I can set this up, and then I can hit the reboot, bo uh, reboot button uh, on my BeagleBone. And the very first uh, string that appears on the console is actually uh, U-Boot SPL. So at that point, Grab Serial will begin its measurement. Uh, and then the other thing is that if you're saving to a file, it makes sense to put a timeout on there so that Grab Serial will correctly uh, shut itself down and save all output to the file. Uh, this is what uh, you will see from Grab Serial. Yeah, it's not hugely interesting. Uh, what you really want to look at, of course, are these uh, timestamps down, uh, down the left side. And, okay, time for a demo. So what I want to do is uh, just to boot the system up using a more or less default um, uh, configuration, which actually is the one that's in there. So, um, so this is my BeagleBone. It's, I'm using one of the LCD capes. You're probably not going to have a little bit of difficulty seeing this, but um, I don't have an easy way of putting this on the screen. So this is running the, the vanilla uh, code. If I hit the reset button here, we should see, yeah, it starts booting. There's U-boot, there's the kernel, there's system D. And then at some point, it runs the Qt demo, and it boots up and does the, yeah, does the animation thing. 
So that's the, that's the starting point, and um, it's not particularly fast. So analyzing that using Grab Serial, we find that uh, the time spent is roughly even between U-boot, uh, the kernel, and uh, init, uh, with the kernel being slightly longer. And uh, I measured it to be 11.76 uh, seconds. Uh, I should say, I'm actually measuring from the point at which I start the Qt demo app. Um, I didn't have any, any means of registering when the, when, the, uh, app when the image actually appears on the screen. Ideally, I should have a camera or something to detect that, uh, but I don't. Okay, so we need to start improving on that. 11 seconds is, is way too much. So um, I'm going to start off with uh, optimizing user space, which was three point something seconds. You could argue maybe I should have started with the longest uh, delay, which is in the kernel. But no, it's better to start with the user space first. It's easier to optimize user space uh, and then turn your attention to the kernel afterwards. So kind of things we can do here. Um, so I've graded them from easy to, in this case, difficult. Um, so the easiest thing is just to reorder uh, the sequence in which applications are run. Uh, so we can do that in a couple of ways. Um, oh, OK, that's on the next slide. Uh, so we, 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 we can actually start application earlier in the, in the boot sequence, which is great. Uh, other things we could do, we could uh, tweak the uh, compiler optimization flags. That may or may not have an advantage. Chances are, actually, they're already set to uh, fairly optimum values. Um, and then, if you want to still dig into it deeper, you have more complicated things. You can change uh, the way the linker works. You can pre-link things. You can merge uh, sections together and so on. Uh, but that gets more and more messy as you get into that stuff. To help me with this, I'm going to introduce the second tool, which is BootChart. Uh, so BootChart is a little daemon uh, process called BootChart daemon. Uh, you arrange so that that daemon process runs uh, instead of init. So when you boot up, it runs the BootChart daemon. The BootChart daemon then starts the real init uh, process, and it then has the ability or the opportunity to log everything that happens from that point onwards. So we'll need to modify the kernel command line and uh, point it at sbin boot chart D. And uh, that will generate, after the uh, is booted up, it generates a, uh, a tar uh, file bootchart.tgz. And then you copy that to, the tar uh, to your, your PC. And you can then use uh, the boot chart command to actually analyze that and to produce a nice graph. So I have an example of the graph on the next slide. Um, you're not expected to be able to read it because um, I had to shrink it down quite a lot to get it onto the screen. So this is purely uh, eye candy. But you can see what a boot chart uh, screen looks like. And um, so in this part here, we can see the various things that get started up and the relative time uh, they, that they get started. So somewhere down here should be, actually, I can't even see it just now. Somewhere down here is, uh, oh, here it is. Uh, here's the uh, Qt uh, demo uh, example. Uh, so that gets started at this point here. And then these little lines here, they give you some idea of, uh, of CPU resource, it, resource usage. Uh, so blue line if it's actually executing on the CPU at that point. So you can look at this, and you can analyze it, and you can say, hey, we need to uh, optimize this piece. We need to start this piece before that piece, um, and so on and so forth. Um, so looking at that boot chart, I discovered that the application wasn't, wasn't starting up until three and a half seconds after init starts. And that's kind of way too long, given that the whole point of this um, 
system is to run my, in this case, Qt application. Um, really, we need to start this app uh, sooner. So there's a couple of things I could start doing here then. If I were using the uh, default system D init on Yocto, then I could play around with the, uh, the start sequence. Uh, as you know, with system 5 init, uh, the sequence in which daemons are started is determined by the start script, which, has, which begins with an S and then a two-digit number. The lower the number, the sooner it starts. So I could, for example, set it to be S01, and that will be one of the early things started. If I'm using system D, um, you can do a similar kind of thing. You have to put into the uh, unit uh, the, uh, sorry, you have to change the, uh, the dependency in the unit, and there's an example of that at the end of this presentation. Um, or you can just kind of skip all that stuff out completely, which is what I'm going to do uh, in my example, and you can write a little script which actually runs your program and then runs init very much in the same way as uh, the boot chart daemon uh, I just described. When doing all of, all of this, of course, you need to validate that at the point at which your application starts, the resources that it's going to be using are ready and available. So you should be aware that quite likely, uh, th if, if you do as I'm going to do and, and start the, uh, the uh, application immediately that the kernel has booted, you have to be aware that most likely at this point the uh, uh, root file system is read-only. Uh, other file systems uh, will not be mounted at this point. Uh, most likely the network won't be configured and so on. So I would have to uh, modify the behavior of my app to handle those cases. Nevertheless, this is the most important thing in the world, so I need to have it running early. So here's a little script that will do uh, just that. Um, so we can see that, well, first of all, that there's an echo at the start there. That's mostly so that I have a string that I can uh, recognize in grab serial so that I can see um, in my grab serial, grab serial log exactly when it started. Then I launch a Qt demo with appropriate uh, strings. And then I put another little string which I can log to see that it has been launched. Um, and then I discovered even when I did that, it was still a little bit slow to start up because uh, actually when you launch uh, system D, that takes up a lot of CPU cycles. So I hacked that just by putting a sleep in there to give Qt demo a bit of a chance to get going before system D kind of jumps in and gobbles everything up. And so first pass optimization then uh, we basically, by using this technique, um, cut out the, the majority of the user space or the init time um, delay. So now we've got it down to uh, eight and a bit seconds, uh, and user space is no longer the issue. So it's time to look at the kernel. So hacking the kernel. So there are a number of things you can do here. Again, graded from easy to not so easy. The, the simplest thing to do, and it gains you quite a lot, uh, is just to um, reduce the amount of uh, number of messages you get on the serial console. Because every time you have a print K in the kernel that goes to the serial console, it has to then wait for that, uh, that string to be sent at, at this case, 115 uh, K board. So you just need to add quiet to the kernel command line, and that typically is going to save you um, something of the order of a second. So that's nice and easy to do. Uh, what else can you do? Well, typically, especially in the case of the uh, BeagleBone, it has been configured with a whole bunch of things I'm not actually going to be uh, using. So I can start slimming that down. Um, I can do a similar kind of thing to the device tree. Uh, so if uh, there, are, there is hardware uh, defined in the device tree that I'm not actually using, I can just uh, go through the device tree, mark it as being disabled. That will then uh, tell the kernel, the device driver, not to probe that piece of hardware, and that can save me some, uh, some 
milliseconds or tens of milliseconds. If after you've done all that, you find you still are not hitting the um, uh, your, your 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 benchmark, then you can consider doing more complicated things. Ultimately, you need to look more deeply into why the kernel is taking time. Maybe optimize a uh, debug uh, uh, a buggy uh, device driver. Maybe doing some other stuff. I'm not going to go into any more detail on that. Um, at this point, we need to uh, look at another tool, the third of the, of the three tools I mentioned, uh, and this is uh, Boot Graph. So Boot Graph is something that is uh, basically a, a kernel feature, and it allows us to graph what happens uh, in kernel uh, during initialization. Uh, so to do this, uh, you need to turn a couple of configuration options on in the kernel. And you need to tweak the kernel command line yet again. You need to set uh, init call a debug. Uh, and that will then cause a whole bunch of stuff to be printed out, uh, which you can then capture. And I'm using here D message and redirect into boot.log. So that gives you the init log. And then you use a fancy Python script, uh, sorry, Perl script, um, uh, in the uh, which is part of the kernel source code, uh, bootgraph.pl. And that takes that log and generates a nice little graph for you. So I did that uh, on my BeagleBone. And there's this big uh, green section uh, there, which I wasn't expecting. And it's marked uh, RAID 6 Select Algo. And that puzzled me when I first uh, saw this. I thought, RAID? Beaglebone? How does this work? Um, so a little bit of um, uh, exploration of the kernel. I discovered that uh, RAID 6 is a dependency of the ButterFS file system. So by default, in fact, even might be necessary, I'm not quite sure. If you're using ButterFS, then it has to enable RAID 6. OK, don't ask me why, but that's just the way it is. Um, but the good news is uh, I'm just using ext4. I'm not using ButterFS. So I can just whip all this out. So uh, in this particular case, uh, just by removing uh, ButterFS from the, from the kernel configuration, I save myself two seconds. So. That's quite a big win. So I removed uh, ButterFS. I added in quiet uh, to the kernel command line. And I also experimented with reducing um, the kernel size. So um, I also uh, changed out of the configuration stuff that I know I'm not using. So for example, the Wi-Fi driver uh, is enabled by default. But I'm not using Wi-Fi. Uh, in this case, so get rid of, rid of it. Uh, that and a few other things. I managed to cut the kernel size down. There's what well, the Z image, the compressed kernel. I cut it down from seven, no, 5.6 megs to 3.2 megs. So not quite half, but nearly. And putting that all together, uh, I managed to save uh, three uh, three seconds from my boot time. So we're doing quite well. So I've shrunk. Uh, the user space, I shrunk down uh, the kernel uh, boot time. It's now time to look at the uh, U-boot uh, boot time. So kind of things we can do here, well, there's one very obvious thing we can do, uh, which is to remove the boot delay, which I'll come to on the next slide, um, which is by default um, used in, in at least in development when you're working with U-Boot. Um, the other thing I can do is to look at the default boot scripts, which in the case of the BeagleBone are quite uh, complex. Um, I could then do the same with U-Boot as I did with, uh, with, with, the, with the kernel. I could actually then start compiling out U-Boot functionality that I don't need, um, prevent it from probing devices that, I, um, that are never going to be used. Um, and I could do a whole bunch of other optimizations by hacking the code if I wanted. And there is one uh, thing which I've marked as, as harder here, although it's not that hard. Uh, I could switch to using Falcon mode, which I'll describe in a couple of slides' time. Uh, 
Okay, so boot delay. So this is a bit of a cheat because this is so simple, it's, it's kind of hardly worth mentioning. Uh, but by default, you will see that when you boot up a U-boot, you get this line that says something like press space to abort uh, auto-boot in two seconds. So that automatically adds two seconds to your boot time. So at the touch of a mouse or touch of a, of a keyboard, I can get rid of that and set boot delay to zero, and I've saved two seconds. Fantastic. The only slight snag with this is it makes it difficult to get back to the U-boot prompt. Um, it is still possible because um, there is a bit of time. It, it isn't really zero seconds uh, that it reduces it to. There's a bit of time. If you hit the key after U-boot has initialized the, uh, the UART, but before it actually checks uh, for input on the UART. So you have like half a second or something maybe a little bit less, a few, a few hundred milliseconds. If you're really quick, you can hit the, the space bar at that point and you can still get back to your U-boot prompt. It may take you three or four attempts, but you will do it. Uh, the boot scripts. Um, if you look at the boot script for the uh, BeagleBone, it's grown, every, 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 uh, every time I look at it, it gets bigger. So it's about a hundred lines of uh, fairly dense U-boot uh, script. And it basically probes every possible device that you could, you could find boot files on. Um, so it could be MMC, it could be USB, it could be Flash. It spends a whole lot of time probing all these things and then it finally decides what's to do, what to do and then does it. Um, in practice, you only really need like two lines. You need to set a, a, a boot uh, command and you need to set uh, the, uh, the boot args. Nothing else really matters. So again, we can make this more specialized. We can just put in our own customized uh, boot script, which just does the things that we want to do in our particular platform. And that can save you mm, um, 100 milliseconds, something of that sort, maybe a couple hundred milliseconds. Um, on the tricky side, I mentioned Falcon mode, and uh, this is kind of quite neat. It requires a little bit of uh, jiggery-pokery, which again I've described in more detail at the end of the presentation in the kind of extras section. Um, but it's kind of interesting. So to understand how Falcon mode uh, helps, you have to know a tiny bit about how SOCs bootstrap. So typically there are three stages. When you power on, you start running the ROM code on chip. And the ROM code will load the first stage bootloader uh, from, storage, from some storage medium, usually um, either e uh, MMC or, uh, or flash memory or SPI NOR or something. Um, it loads the first stage bootloader into uh, some on chip static RAM. At this point, we don't actually have working uh, DRAM, so we can't put it into DRAM. It has to fit into the SRAM. SRAM on most chips is fairly limited. On the case of the BeagleBone, it's 128K, less a few bits, which leaves you, I think, about 120K of useful memory. Um, and so, typically, there isn't enough space in one, uh, certainly in, the, in 128K, to have a full U-boot uh, binary. So hence, we have to go from the second stage loader, the SPL, to the tertiary uh, program loader, the TPL, which is U-boot itself. And then you run the U-boot scripts, and then U-boot loads the kernel, which is kind of a fourth stage. So that's what normally happens. Um, but we can, in some cases at least, uh, miss out the TPL stage and go straight from SPL to kernel. And this is Falcon mode. So essentially with Falcon mode, the way this, the, this works is magic is essentially by creating a, a shrunk, um, uh, putting all the functionality rather of U-boot, uh, shrinking it down and putting it into the SPL, which remember has to be less than 128K. Um, doing this means you have to drop most of the user interface stuff. In fact, all of the user interfa interface stuff uh, you have to do some special things to create uh, a fixed set of environment variables in a particular area and join and, and put that into the uh, U-boot environment and so on. So it's a bunch of steps. It takes like half an hour or something to do it the first time. Uh, 
Um, so now taking the measurement, so the, the, the measurement on the slide uh, shows the effect of simplifying the uh, boot script and just removing the uh, two second delay. Uh, this does not include the Falcon mode stuff. And so doing this, I actually get it down to 2.8 seconds. Mm. If I were to add in the Falcon mode, that would get it down to nearer two seconds, which is kind of my, my internal, um, uh, I didn't actually specify this, but my, my aim when doing this was to get the boot down to two seconds or, or thereabouts. So I haven't quite achieved the, the, that, but I very nearly have. The other thing I should say that uh, all these measurements I did, um, really because I, of, of thinking of doing this as a demo, I actually did all this on, a, uh, on an SD card. If I were to put this into the, um, the on-chip EMMC, that also would save me mm, half a second, I'm guessing, uh, because EMMC is faster than SD cards. Okay, so just for the fun of it then, let's have a quick demo, see how that looks. And for this, I need to do a bit of a flip. So for the purposes of the demo, I just, like I said, I kept everything on SD card, so I can, in theory at least, flip the right one in. Switch to Minicom and power up. Yeah. It, it's definitely better. I, uh, there's, there's still more things that could be done here. So let, let me just show that kind of live. Again, I'm not quite sure if you can see uh, this at the back. You, if you've brought opera glasses with you, you may need them. If not, maybe not. But if I hit the, the reset button now, display goes blank, penguin appears. Uh, and QT appears. Yeah, it's not snappy, I'll, I'll admit. Um, but it's definitely an improvement on what we had to start with. Okay. Um, so that's kind of uh, the end of the, the stuff I want to mention at this point. Um, key thing uh, I want to keep on pushing home is the idea that when you're doing this kind of things, do things in a reproducible uh, kind of way. So begin with the low hanging fruit, go through, see how that, how far that gets you towards the um, uh, your 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 target, and kind of iterate until you get close enough. Um, And to keep all this uh, kind of happening, so it, 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 it quite often happens that uh, a particular use case is optimized for, and yeah, we reach, reach the target, and then people kind of forget about it. So it becomes important to include uh, boot time as a criterion in your continuous integration, and also a criterion when you are designing and adding in new features. Somebody in the room should be saying, ah, but that feature is gonna take five seconds to initialize. How are we going to fix that? Okay, so it needs to be part of the process. You need to keep on keeping this in mind. Um, so yeah, so that's basically uh, the end of that. I have uh, five minutes or so for questions, and um, then I'll, I'll quickly go through the other slides. So first of all then, who has a question? Okay, you're closest, so you get to ask the first question. Thanks for that, Chris. That's very interesting. Um, one thought came to mind. Do you have any comment to make on whether it's useful to look at loading uncompressed kernel images if you've got a decent throughput from your storage medium? Can that help? Ah, yeah, okay. The, so the question, the question is then, yeah, is, is should, we, should you compress the kernel or not? Um, I didn't put that on the slides because, um, uh, well, I didn't have time really. Um, the, so the, 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 the idea is that normally we have a compressed kernel uh, stored in a storage medium in flash memory, and then you uh, load that into memory and decompress it. 
So there are two stages there. One is loading the uh, compressed image, and the second stage is uncompressing it. And both of those take some time. Uh, so sometimes the decompression, it, I mean, it depends on the speed of your processor, how fast it can decompress versus the speed of the, uh, of the storage medium. If you have a fast processor and slow storage media, then uh, compressed kernel is the best answer. If you have fast media but a slow processor, then uncom uh, uncompressed is the, is the best answer. So the simple answer, the simple answer is it depends uh, on the ratio of the speed of your storage medium to the, uh, the, the speed of your processor. Okay, uh, person there at the back in the white, can you, can you suddenly negotiate between yourselves to exchange the microphone? <coughs> so we, we need the microphone so that uh, the question gets recorded uh, on, on the video, otherwise people watching this at home won't, uh, won't know what we're talking about. Yeah, so first, uh, many thanks for your talk. I just want to add something to user land boot time optimization. So actually, for our use case, for instance, it turned out that we lost a lot um, of time, like two seconds, on uh, bit shifting. So I just want to, to add some tools uh, to make the, the thing round. So first, uh, cheap mm -hmm. rough. Mm -hmm. may come to mind, but be aware that uh, when using Cheaprof, it uh, has like only resolution of 10 mi milliseconds. So then you may go for O profile, mm -hmm. but be aware that uh, you need to enable high resolution timers in kernel. Um, well, so it, uh, everything is contained in the LT, uh, T and G suite, I think provided by Eclipse. So it's a bunch of tools. Uh, and it really gives you a nice 80-20 optimization or, or guard, so which uh, functions are, um, are called uh, the most of the time, and also the time which is spent in the functions. So we, yeah. uh, I just wanted to add it because it, it really saved us uh, some seconds, because it's not only about shifting, uh, priorities of um, the, the processes, but also to optimize and also leave um, the optimization to, to compiler. So compile with minus O2. This was also some other seconds yeah, uh, sure, for yeah, us. Yeah. So uh, just ju just to give some pinpoints for this, because it, it really saves us a lot of boot time. Cool, yeah. The, the one thing I would, I would say, so profiling your, your application uh, is definitely a great thing to do. The one thing I would say is never use GProf. Uh, there are always better tools to use. Uh, personally, I would either use Perf uh, or use OProfile, or if I really want to delve in, um, uh, LTTNG is great. But never, ever use GProf. It is broken in many ways. You next. Uh, could you bring the microphone down the front, please? I was going to say something oh, okay. along the way. How about that? Go on then. Uh, just, just in terms of um, U-Boot, I wanted to put in a plug for the tracing feature. Okay. You're trying to really yeah. get your boot time down very, very, very low, mm -hmm. and obviously turning off the console. Yeah, yeah, and in a similar way to uh, putting quiet on the uh, kernel command line, th there is a, a, a an equivalent U-Boot uh, command which will make U-Boot much less chatty and therefore take up uh, less time. Okay, yes, sir. So I've got a couple of comments. Uh, firstly, if you don't need drivers at boot time, compile them out as modules, because then you can load them once your application needs them. Or yeah, yeah. Again, that, that, that's another thing that I, I could have put in, but I, I didn't want to over uh, overemphasize these things. But yeah, one thing you can do is, is basically delayed execution of certain device drivers. If you need, for example, Wi-Fi but not at boot time then compile out the wi uh, make, make the Wi-Fi drivers modules, and then they'll, those modules will get loaded up after your application has started. So you're kind of doing a bit of time shifting there. Yeah. And the Perfect. other thing, I don't know if Linux has got it yet, but being able to um, thread the later init calls, uh, once you have a number, if you have a m number of processor cores, you can parallelize your init inside the kernel, which can save you a bit of time if you have a lot of devices. Uh, indeed, you can. Um, the, again, the, 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 as you delve more and more in, into these uh, things, you you get to more and more customizations, which give you a maintenance burden. But yeah, you can parallelize the init in that way. 
uh, in, 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 your ca in, in particular cases. Okay, anyone else? We have exactly one minute left. No? Okay, well, thank you all very much, and um, happy lunchtime. <laughs>